Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find links to the blogs, to Twitters, and all the usual stuff on there. Once again, I have Jeff Squires of Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks a lot for your time. Hey, Brock. Nice to talk to you again. And uh, so uh, this is one of those little awkward times, right? We're, we're in post-supercomputing, uh, pre-Christmas you know, you might get the episode out by the end of the year. It might be early January. But uh, regardless of the, the strange timing, we have an interesting topic today because this is actually something that I am actively working on. And, and with our guests today, I actually work with them uh, quite frequently. So I'm, I'm going to have to intentionally play dumb to some of these questions uh, to uh, give a little, little – just, just pretend it's an actual interview. <laughs> Okay, so yes, uh, you gave a little bit away there, but our guest today um, is going to be talking about a library called LibFabric. So, Sean, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? So, hello, um, Brock, Jeff. Uh, my name is Sean Hefty. I currently work with Intel. I've been with Intel about 20-some years. Um, I'm involved with, with Open Fabrics, um, developing network and high-performance uh, interfaces to hardware. I also work with the Linux uh, RDMA kernel. Uh, and the focus, what we're looking at with uh, LibFabric, um, you may also hear, hear me call it OFI, Open Fabric Interfaces. Uh, this is a, basically a new set of interfaces that we're trying to develop in the open source to bridge the gap between higher level applications like MPI and PGAS and ShimM to uh, high performance hardware like InfiniBand, iWarp, um, and those sort of devices. So, uh, can you expand on what exactly a fabric normally means to most people in high-performance computing? So, our, our use of a fabric is basically a small self-contained network, uh, the, the immediate clusters as opposed to the internet. So, we're, we're looking at really systems that are tightly coupled, um, usually often may not have routers involved. Usually, it's just going to be switches. Um, if there are routers involved, there'd be a very small number. Uh, so we're talking about a network that really exists within a single building, uh, maybe one floor of a building, for systems that are trying to, to solve one single uh, problem. Okay, so what is LibFabric then? So LibFabric is an effort to – it's a library. Um, it, it, it basically started out as a framework of – different sets of interfaces uh, that work together to try to export services of a fabric or of a network up to the applications. Um, so it's not just really this is an interface that you want to have with the network. These are really the services that the network can offer, uh, stuff like uh, RMA or RDMA capabilities, atomic operations, maybe something like collective operations. So we're looking at trying to define a, a library that exposes these interfaces, these capabilities up to the apps uh, so for them to, to be able to make, take advantage of what the hardware can really provide and what the switches can help provide as well. And, and so is there really nothing like this in existence already? I mean, what, what is the, the use case for creating a new library versus, for example, uh, expanding on an existing library? So we looked at at several libraries, the, the most common one you see in existence really now is, is libib verbs. Um, and, and the verbs library, it works well for InfiniBand devices. Uh, it's designed around the InfiniBand hardware and what the InfiniBand hardware uh, is, is exposing and capable of. What we're trying to do is expand that beyond, this is not just InfiniBand. We want an, a set of APIs that are fabric agnostic, for example. Um, we don't want to tie it into a specific model of you must make progress this way. You must implement this sort of feature in your hardware. Um, we want to be able to say you implement it in software, implement it in hardware. Uh, from our interfaces, we don't care uh, how it's implemented. We don't want to tie into a specific vendor or a specific topology or um, architecture such as InfiniBand. So I, I don't know that there's really anything, nothing we've seen that, that's out there that tries to provide this lower level interface um, that's an abstraction of what the services are that the, the fabric is providing. Now, in some ways, the way you just described that is kind of like 
the charter of MPI itself, right? It's meant to be a relatively low lever, low layer uh, abstraction, gets you into very close performance uh, harmonization with the network hardware itself, right? So you're adding very little software overhead and things like that. You know, you're low level and and provide abstracting away what the underlying network actually is. How would you? differentiate this from the MPI API? So this is, I think, a set of interfaces that are, MPI is one of our, our primary consumers, obviously, uh, MPI, HMM, and the PGAS. But MPI is one of our major, major focus areas. So this is providing interfaces, uh, so the MPI doesn't have to talk directly to hardware. We don't, you don't really want MPI to have to um, code to every piece of hardware, to write to hardware registers, for example, so this is basically an abstraction above writing to the hardware registers. Now, what are, these are the services that the provider is giving uh, up to MPI, so the MPI can really focus on um, creating op- optimizing for different types of hardware um, based on different features, rather than optimizing on uh, this vendor's version three of their hardware does something. I want to that vendor's version four does something different. Um, really abstracting that away from the from MPI so that the vendors, as they change their hardware, can add new features without requiring MPI to change um, and to update for every feature that that the hardware is giving. So it's going to be some protection, I think, from MPI to have to change for every piece of hardware. The hardware vendor themselves deals with um, providing these, these services up to the application. So some network vendors already provide pretty high level abstractions instead of verbs. Um, things like uh, specifically MXM, MX, create portals. What, why not just use one of those or build on top of one of those? So in, in some cases, the the interfaces you mentioned are proprietary. Right? They're vendor specific. Um, MXM, for example, is, is Melnox specific. Uh, so you, you really would be asking other vendors to try to a, a adopt a, a possibly a competing vendor's API um, as their own. Uh, so you, you may not even have the ability to do that because of, of copyright um, or, or IP uh, restrictions on using those interfaces. Uh, in, in some of the cases, that those APIs are abstractions, but they're really abstractions on top of lower-level APIs. And, and that's what we're targeting is that lower level. Um, for, for example, MXM is implemented on top of um, and it's really targeting a specific type of hardware, which is InfiniBan. Uh, MX, for example, you know, tar- targeting Nearnet. Uh, so that, again, you have a vendor-specific set of interfaces um, that was targeting a specific vendor's hardware. Uh, in, even Intel has the PSM as an interface that targets their hardware and, and their protocols that they use. So this is rather than saying we, we don't want to necessarily pick a single vendor, because um, for an open source um, effort here, picking a vendor, it, it's it, you're not going to get uh, pull or push behind it um, to say, hey, yeah, change your hardware or change your implementation to use this other vendor's interface. So I think there is an issue there, uh, at least from a business sense, of trying to say we can't pick a specific vendor's hardware or interface um, to move forward. Are there other alternatives um, that we can use? Okay, so those interfaces are all proprietary, but obviously you're still going to be running on those networks. So is there going to still be like a vendor provided lower level thing they give to LibFabric? There, there will be. So LibFabric's designed, um, and we're not tossing the ideas uh, and trying to start over from scratch. We're trying to, to make sure we leverage all the ideas that these existing interfaces have, uh, the services they have, the capabilities they have, and just try to improve upon it. So within like LibIB Verbs, for example, you have uh, vendor specific plugins to verbs to interface that, that do, do the implementation. We have the same concept in LibFabric. Each vendor will provide their own implementation to their hardware of these different interfaces. Okay, so let's take a step back here and um, say, why, why should HPC customers or, or even end users, why should they care about LibFabric? You know, if, if um, Mellanox has frankly done a, a brilliant marketing game uh, of you know, getting their brand and Mellanox and RDMA and Verbs into you know the lexicon of the HPC community, 
And so is there going to be any kind of difficulty in getting lib fabric adoption if people think, oh, well, no, I need verbs to get good performance or so on? So, you know, translated differently, why should HPC customers care about lib fabric? So I think the primary reason is, is verbs is really designed around InfiniBand and InfiniBand hardware. Um, so if you have verbs-based hardware, verbs can work for you fairly well. It, it's when you have hardware that's not verbs-based. Uh, for example, Intel's own InfiniBand hardware is not verbs-based. Um, Cisco's hard has hardware that, that's not verbs-based. Uh, I believe there's others from like uh, Cray, um, Bull. There's there's other vendors who have hardware that's high performance. And targeting the, the HPC industry, and their hardware is really not uh, built around verbs and supporting the verb semantics, uh, ordering, progress model, uh, that you really need a new interface to take advantage of. So uh, what we're trying to do with, with LibFabric is we know we have these different interfaces. We have – essentially, we're ending up in a situation where every vendor is creating their own set of interfaces to their hardware, and we're trying to say – we don't want to have five or six or seven different interfaces that everybody has to code to that, that ends up fragmenting the industry and, and really hurting adoption of, of these high-performance fabrics. If we can get these different vendors to come together and say, here's a single interface, it exposes the hardware features and services that your hardware can do, uh, and it allows you to do it efficiently, um, then hopefully the, the, the vendors can adopt the fabric, the uh, the MPI, the PGAS, those people will start using it, uh, and then it kind of springs off of that rather than having to code and support every different interface that every vendor wants to, to provide. So obviously people are going to be running on actual hardware that has all these features and stuff like that, so aren't you just moving the work from the MPI vendor to the LibFabric community? I mean, no matter what, it's got to be written, so aren't you just moving it from one place to the other? In a sense, yeah, you're, you're moving the work, but you're moving it from uh, MPI into the actual uh, vendor. Uh, the vendor should have the best idea of how to use their hardware, um, and they they can basically add new features to their hardware, uh, move stuff, for example, implementation from software to hardware, change how the hardware implements certain features, and all this can be done without MPI having to change. So. As the hardware vendor updates their, their drivers, changes their provider, MPI will just see a performance gain uh, versus having MPI have to do that coding. Uh, and then again, the alternative is changing MPI means you, you're not just changing MPI, but you're changing every application that wants to write to these interfaces. Uh, so by putting it into provider, you have one place where the provider can make these updates, all applications. So every MPI that's using this gets an update. You don't have to update open MPI. Uh, MPitch, OSU MPIs, um, Intel MPI, and not to mention stuff like you know, Shemem, the PGAS, Coray, Fortrans, uh, Parallel C compiling. Um, you don't have all those applications needing to update. If they all just write to the fabric, then as the, the provider does their updates, adds new features, uh, the, the applications can just take advantage of it. So now you mentioned more than just MPI there. Um, so, I mean, how much are you targeting here? Like what, what are the use cases that you expect LibFabric to be used in? So we're targeting a fairly broad range. Just the initial target is, is really focused at HPC. Um, but obviously we, we, we want to be able to expand to as large a, an audience as possible. Um, we want to look at the enterprise space. We've had discussions with um, like – the non-volatile memory uh, extension group, the NVME. Um, we've looked, talked with storage vendors uh, and what sort of features are they looking for out of these APIs. We've talked with uh, Oracle uh, database systems, IBM, um, to see what are they needing from these interfaces. Uh, and then you have other applications, you know, data streaming, video streaming type applications. What are they really looking for uh, even some of the specific ones like you know, Google, Facebook, when you have discussions with them, you know, what sort of network interfaces are you looking for? What sort of features are you looking for? Uh, can we meet the needs of, of those vendors as well? And that's part of what the way LibFabric is designed is to, to try to identify what are the common features they're wanting, expose the services in a reasonable way to meet as broad the applications as possible, but then still allows room to grow, saying, okay, we're not going to be able to hit everybody's needs um, 
but make it so it's easily extensible to say, well, here's a, a brand new set of requirements from this other group that wasn't known at the time we wrote the original API. Can we easily add sets of calls to support what that application needs without having to, to rev the entire API? So uh, it sounds like you're actually creating a new API then. So if something, like this isn't a drop-in replacement for libib verbs. If I have some software in this transition period, I still need to have both libraries, don't I? Yeah, so it, it, it's a new set of APIs. Um, LibFabric will be a, a 1.0 API set. Uh, it, it's not trying to be backwards compatible with uh, verbs or uh, PSM or any of the APIs like MXM or MX, any of those APIs. It, it's a brand new set of APIs that are being defined for the applications to use. Okay, so going through this whole process, you know, you mentioned that you, you've, you've worked on the open fabrics, you know, the, the kernel stuff and all that sort of things. What have we learned from the last, I don't know, we have to 10 years of verbs and OFED and, you know, what, what have we learned? Yeah, so verbs has been around for about 10 years. Um, there are several things that have shown up uh, over that time. Um, so the, one of the, the one of the biggest issues with verbs when people talk about verbs is verbs as itself uh, is not a usable library. It doesn't have any way to set up uh, connections, for example. So verbs really has this dependency on some other library um, in order to help set up the communication path. And, and that's one of the, the problems that showed up that even Red Hat came uh, came to the uh, open fabrics mailing list and said, hey, here's an issue. We've got these two libraries. They're very closely coupled. They really should be the same library, but there should be one set of interfaces to do this. So we want to make sure that we we don't ignore that and say, okay, we don't want these separate libraries just because uh, we need to have these together. We need to make sure that the management pieces um, are not necessarily exposed directly to the application. So an application doesn't need to code to uh, the InfiniBand subnet manager. The application just doesn't care what sort of fabric it was. We want to design APIs around that support as well. And then when you get down to smaller details, and this really shows up in the last two to three years when um, you have coprocessors added back to the systems. It's like Intel Xeon Phi. You basically hit a power barrier that per node, and you can either have a very small number of cores going fast, or you have a very large number of cores going slow. And as we've gone to a very large number of cores going slow, you start to see inefficiencies in the software show up even more. So data structures that are large uh, or addressing that's very large, um, if you have to have all tall connections, the memory footprint becomes huge on these systems. And because you have so many cores involved, uh, every time you have to take a branch in the code, um, you, you start seeing the impact there on the, especially the slower cores, like the the, the Xeon Phi or even like the NVIDIA offload. Um, you you have impacts there that requires you to rethink how you design these APIs. What do those data structures look like? What does the function signature actually look like? And this is where it becomes difficult to try to fix an existing API. You really need a whole new set of function calls to be able to fix these problems. So what is the status? I mean, where is the LibFabric project in terms of design, in terms of implementation, in terms of availability, things like that? So it's been under, there's a working group. Uh, they meet every Tuesday currently. Um, again, it's open participation. So it's set up within Open Fabrics as an organization, but it, you don't have to be a member to participate. Uh, we have several non-members there. Um, We've gathered a lot of requirements, probably a couple hundred at this point. Uh, we have a, a library that's been developed. We have a set of interfaces that's been developed. We're looking at having uh, a release process started in Q1 of next year with probably the first release of LibFabric sometime at the end of uh, Q1, probably in March of, of 2015. Now, is the design of the API stable? Is this something that uh, developers should start looking at the API and thinking about their applications and how they would adapt to it? And, and obviously, we're talking lower layer things uh, like you mentioned, you know, MPI implementations, PGAS implementations, SHMEM implementations, things like that. So the API is still 
changing. Uh, it, I would say it's mostly stable. It's it's uh, not huge changes. There's been some minor tweaks. Um, right now would actually be a really good time to take a look at, at LibFabric and the APIs uh, because you have the ability to help steer the current API before we freeze for a 1.0 release. Um, so if you want a chance to actually get in and help steer certain calls certain ways or define certain functionality, now is the time to join. Um, if you're wanting to just code to a stable API, you'd be looking at more towards probably the middle of Q1, uh, so into January, start of February, uh, if you wanted to try to start developing to these APIs to see how well they match. So what networks do you have kind of working right now? Prototype or production? What, what, do you, what have you got? So there are currently four different providers. Um, there's a provider over Cisco's US NIC. Um, there's a provider that, that sits on top of Intel's um, InfiniBand uh, PSM hardware. Um, those are, are both fairly complete and, and targeting fairly high performance. Uh, there's also a provider that sits on top of Verbs. So this is actually a layering of LibFabric over uh, LibIB Verbs and the LibRDMACM. Um, and that's there to give you functionality over all existing Verbs hardware. So Rocky, InfiniBand, iWarp uh, devices should all work uh, through the Verbs provider. Um, you can, and even though it's layering, it's, it's still looking at trying to be as performant as possible. Um, the performance hit would, would probably be unmeasurable by most applications. Uh, you're talking about just a translation from one send call to another in, in most cases. And then there's a sockets provider, uh, which just runs over a normal TCP or UDP. Uh, the primary focus of the sockets provider is so anybody writing to the LibFabric interface, they don't need special hardware. They can just write an app uh, on top of their laptop, um, for example, on top of just some system, and, and see... Uh, are these interfaces actually working for them? Um, how close does it match? What does it take to get it to run? So they don't have to run on special hardware at the moment. So the LibFabric uh, is designed, again, very similar to Verbs. You have this framework where the LibFabric defines just these APIs and the semantics of those APIs and the behavior that you, that you really want. And then under that, you have different vendors or different software libraries that feed into those APIs and implement some set of those APIs. Uh, and we just call those plugin modules providers. So very similar like MPI has plugins, LibIB Verbs has plugins, LibFabric also has plugins, um, and we have multiple providers there. All right, so you have these providers, plugin types, and so on. You, you listed um, several different types that are there already um, or are currently being worked on. How, how hard is it to add uh, another one? You know, let's say I've come up, I'm a hardware vendor and I've got my brilliant new network type um, and I want to add support for it to LibFabric. Uh, what, what do I need to do? So if you just download the source code, uh, you, you add your code into a provider and the, the real difficulty is can you support those interfaces? And for a provider, um, a provider could basically pick and choose which set of interfaces they want to support. Uh, think of it almost like sockets. Um, I can implement just a UDP implementation of sockets, or I can implement TCP type sockets. Uh, and LibFabric has the same thing. It has a very wide range of APIs, but a provider doesn't need to support everything. They can just support what they support well, uh, and what depending on what applications they want to target as as well. So it's fairly straightforward, I think, for somebody to join in to, to create a provider for these uh, APIs. Um, it, it's really how much effort it takes on, in terms of talking to their actual hardware. Okay, so you mentioned earlier that you know Q1 um, for the API kind of selling up. What, what is the path for um, LibFabric? Should we start using it now if it's supported on our hardware? Should we wait, and then, like, what's your plan after that? So the, the plan is at the beginning of Q1 to be able to produce a, a package, like an alpha package, so application developers can look at these APIs, look at the stuff, start coding to it, and see, is there a gap for their application? So we can get that feedback in. Uh, and then the, the Open Fabric Interface Working Group, um, 
which is the, the, the group that meets every Tuesday to discuss these APIs. Uh, also, we call it OFIWIG. So they've defined a basically a time-based release. So beyond the initial Q1 release, we're expecting every three months, or basically once a quarter, to have new releases of uh, LibFabric with any bug fixes um, or new features or new APIs to find coming out at every a fairly regular interval um, for the applications. Along with this initial release, uh, obviously we're, we're going to have some uh, set of test programs that are going to be available, and also we're going to try to enable several applications such as MPI um, so that when LibFabric is released, there's at least uh, an MPI available to be able to, to show how an MPI would make use of these APIs and run over it. Yeah, let me just uh, kind of violate my, my interviewer abstraction here and, and throw something else onto your answer there too. An interesting thing to me at least uh, about this whole LibFabric process is that it is kind of being co-designed from both sides, right? So both from the, the network provider layer and uh, the consumer layer and the consumer at least from my perspective, is MPI. And so, for example, um, there is already two different flavors of LibFabric usage in OpenMPI, in the development version of OpenMPI. And there's at least one flavor of LibFabric usage in MPitch as well. And so I, I know that all the MPI vendors, are, or at least the portable ones, are looking very, very hard at LibFabric and contributing back, saying, all right, well, this API is okay, but this one over here, I think we need to tweak it a little bit to do this, and we need a new constant to do that. And, you know, after I tried to code it up and, and uh, you know, have MPI send right over LibFabric, I discovered a few more issues, and da 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 da, da. And it's been an iterative uh, process that I think has actually genuinely made, you know, the end result be better because it's really both the networking people talking to uh, the MPI applications people and the Schmem people and the PGAS people, although I think in this case uh, the MPI community might be a little further ahead in, in terms of implementation of using LibFabric and so on. And then we're all kind of meeting in the middle in this LibFabric playground uh, and trying to set up our toys and be able to share well, uh, and it seems to be working pretty well. Yeah, I think that that's actually a really good point, Jeff, is, is this is I think differs from a lot of the the other API design that's been going on uh, is that this is really trying to merge uh, both the application developers along with the hardware providers underneath and, and make sure that they get APIs that fit well together. Because what we've we've seen is if if you get an API that's too far from the hardware, you end up getting getting inefficiencies that way. But if you get an API that's too far from the application, you get inefficiencies up there. So it's really kind of a balancing act to make sure you get an API that, that matches well to the application, but still maps well down to what the hardware is capable of. All right, so let me put my interviewer hat back on here um, and say, all right, let, let's, um, how, how do I actually get involved, right? I'm going to continue my question from before. I'm, I'm a hardware vendor. I've got a new hardware type. And you talked a little bit about, you know, how I would, you know, add a new provider or plug-in. But how do I actually get involved in the community? Where, where is it hosted? How do I get the code? How do I learn what I need to do for my code? Uh, things like that. So I, I think probably the, the first uh, starting points for anybody trying to get it involved uh, is to go to the openfabrics.org website and join the uh, OFIWIG mailing list. And once you're on the mailing list, you can you can submit questions, um, ask to join the meeting. Uh, for example, if you if you have the capability to join the, the meetings on Tuesdays, uh, so th there's there's a lot of people that join these meetings every week. Uh, you can bring up if you have topics. You can talk to one of the co-chairs. So I'm myself the co-chair along with Paul Garoon from Cray. Uh, you can send us information saying I want to bring up a topic at one of the meetings. Can we schedule that? And we can. You know, try to schedule a time for you to bring up the topics. If you have questions about the code, you can post it to that mailing list. Um, and then also there's a GitHub page uh, and where we have information about LibFabric, uh, all the source codes up on GitHub. Uh, there's a fab test um, repository up there, too, where we're building a test framework for LibFabric. Uh, you can go there, uh, 
look at the issues, look at the source code, uh, even post comments on some of the issues. Or if you have a open an issue, even you can open an issue and saying, hey, I have some hardware I want to fit in here. How do I do it? And somebody may, well, should be able to respond to you up on the, the GitHub is directly. So you said something there. Um, is libfabric part of um, Open Fabrics Enterprise, or is it something else? So libfabric is the output of the OFIWIG, so the, the working group. Um, it's not part of Open Fabric distribution, so the, the OFAD distribution yet, because we don't have a release yet. Um, but it, yeah, it'll be planned to, to merge in and, and line up with uh, one of the OFED releases. So eventually it should be included in like a whatever the next OFED release is after uh, LibFabric is released. So what's the, the license uh, for LibFabric? Because that's actually quite important in our world to make sure that all the licenses align with each other. What should people expect? So LibFabric is, is under the license um, that the Open Fabrics uses, which is a dual uh, GPL version 2 BSD license. Again, it, it's an open source project, so anybody can contribute to it. Um, they need to contribute under the same license. Uh, but we're not discouraging, uh, for example, vendors from having proprietary plugins to this. So the LibFabric is supporting, uh, basically LibFabric ships with the providers. So, so this is one of the changes as well, is, is when you get LibFabric, you should have access to the providers. All four of the providers I mentioned earlier are already shipped with the same package, the same library. Uh, but you could have external uh, providers that somebody can just load and plug in. So one question we kind of left out before is what operating systems uh, is this going to support? It's targeting only Linux at the moment. Uh, there's been several people who've brought up other operating systems, but the only one we're really looking at at the moment is is Linux. Is there any particular kernel version that's required? No, so, so LibFabric does not uh, have any framework that talks to the kernel. Um, so this is, a, again, one of the differences between like libibverbs or the librdmacm, uh, which uses specific kernel interfaces to the devices. Uh, so LibFabric doesn't define any kernel interface, uh, so it can work with any kernel subject to whatever the provider's constraints are. So uh, a lot of us who run systems, we worry about counters and metrics and all these other things. And, and those are normally, you know, network or vendor specific, but sometimes they're abstracted out, you know, Ethernet being the same pretty much everywhere, no matter what vendor it is. Um, does LibFabric provide a tools interface or things like that, or do we still have to depend on the vendor? So currently it's still vendor. Um, we've had discussions um, about how to expose counters in a generic way, how to expose topology information in a generic way. Uh, and I think we're going to continue those discussions within the OFI WIG uh, into early next year. So I, I don't see those showing up within, let's say, the next three to six months um, within LibFabric, but it is an objective to see where does it make sense to actually have these common um, counters, common event registration mechanisms, and common ways of reporting the topology type information. So I know you already mentioned it, but can you uh, mention the LibFabric website again where people can find it and how they can get involved? So, again, openfabrics.org. Uh, that's the main website. You should be able to find from there how to join the, the OFIWIG mailing list. Um, also, if you go to github.com slash OFIWG, uh, that'll give you the, the main uh, GitHub report location for the OFIWIG work for LibFabric and uh, the, the test being developed along with the pointers from there to the, the website. Um, and the main website is ofiwig.github.io uh, slash LibFabric. Yeah, and I think if you Google for LibFabric, um, it'll probably be in the top uh, page worth of results. Right now when I do it today, I see a couple of blog posts that I've written about LibFabric and then the GitHub and, and things like that. So it's still, it's suffering from that new project, you know, Google ability type of thing. There's not a million links to it yet, but uh, it should still be in the first bunch of results that you see. 
Okay, Sean. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.